starting a broadcast. Hello everybody and welcome to another BVNA webinar. We've got attendees coming into the webinar. The numbers are growing quickly. We'll just give it a few seconds before we start this evening. And at the same time, I'm just going to see if we can get live streaming onto Facebook as well. We'll see how that goes this evening. Welcome everybody um, to the second part of um, the infection control webinar. My name is Wendy Nevins. I am currently Senior Vice President of BVNA. A very warm welcome to everybody. Just a few tips before I hand over just to make sure that you get the best out of your webinar experience this evening. You'll see a chat box on your toolbar. Uh, it may be at the top or the bottom of your screen depending on the type of device that you're listening in on. If you have any questions for the speaker, do type them in there as you think of them. We'll hold the questions and we do have some time at the end of the presentation to go through as many questions as we can. If you have any audio problems, which can sometimes happen if you're connected on um, Wi-Fi rather than a wired internet, you can dial in on the telephone. So again, find your toolbar near the chat box and there's a microphone symbol. If you click the little up arrow, you can go to the phone option and you'll be given a telephone number, a meeting ID and a participant ID. So you can dial in on the telephone and still see the presentation on your device. So that's all from me until the end where we'll go through the questions. Um, I'm joined this evening by Louise, BVNA Council member and Amanda is the speaker. So I'll hand over to Louise for your intro. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so good evening, everyone. I am very excited to um, introduce Amanda Curtis, who is our speaker for this evening's webinar. Um, Amanda qualified in 2012 and she has worked in a variety of settings, including at the Queen Mother Hospital for Animals, which is the RVC, um, as a critical care nurse. She has a very keen interest in wound management and has undertaken the Delving Deeper into Wound Certificate. She is also part of the editorial board for the veterinary nurse and has now written several publications. In addition, Amanda is also a BVNA regional representative for South West Wales and is a reviewer for the Veterinary Nursing Journal, which is our BVN, BVNA peer review journal. So I'll hand over to um, Amanda and enjoy. Lovely. Thank you very much, Lou, and uh, welcome, everybody. So we're going to get started tonight by talking a little bit about hand hygiene and obviously the situation now around COVID-19. So this has been pushed quite heavily from the start of everything really so um, we're just going to discuss quickly like why this has been pushed and why it's so important so if you watched the last webinar you'll know that uh, coronaviruses and the COVID-19 are a family of enveloped viruses so this does help to make them really susceptible to a lot of detergents and soaps and disinfectants that are available on the market and this is part of the reason why hand washing's been um, so pushed really, because of their envelope layer is made of lipids, it's really easily broken down. So one of the second reasons then that hand washing is so important is just to help reduce transmission. So we know that these viruses can live in COVID-19 particularly, can live on surfaces in the right environment for quite a prolonged period of time. Um, so it's important that we're frequently washing our hands to try and reduce the amount of um, transient pathogens. So basically pathogens that live actually on the skin surface that we would have picked up from touching another surface. So we're wanting to reduce that as much as we possibly can. And then obviously we're looking at protecting not just ourselves and the animals that we see, and but also others and the of our colleagues and um, our clients that are coming out into the practice as well. So there are different types of hand decontamination. So these are basically set out in different levels. 
Um, so you've initially got your just plain hand washing. So this is something you do probably every day at home of what everybody else would be doing, just using a general soap and water. And all that's really doing is it's actually physically removing contamination. So it's not necessarily actually killing any microbes or pathogens that are on the skin, but it is getting rid of them and washing them away. So you're not then again, walking around and touching things and placing them on surfaces. The other thing that it does is all the natural oils on your hand can actually act as a barrier to trap in those microorganisms. So it does just help again, just regularly wash that away to make sure that we're not spreading any bacteria and pathogens around. The next level up then is our antiseptic hand washes. So these are going to be what we most commonly use in practice settings. And uh, most of us will be used to the kind of typical ones, your sort of chlorhexidines, your iodines, and sort of other ones like that. Um, so these are the same principles as plain hand washing, where you are applying the soap in the same method and it is removing and washing away those pathogens, but it also should be actually helping to kill both resident, which is bacteria and pathogens that are found deeper in the skin. Usually this resident flora isn't actually harmful, but if you have cracks and cuts on your hands and it starts getting into deeper tissue, that's when it can cause problems. But it's also, again, killing off that transient uh, microorganisms that we're picking up indirectly through touching different fomites and different uh, areas within the environment. And then nextly then, we've also got our alcohol-based tanky uh, decontamination. So this is based around us using our alcohol hand sanitizers. Um, so this acts to rapidly um, kill off any resident microorganisms that are found on the surface of the skin. It eliminates the need to wash, but one of the important things with this is it isn't actually a replacement for good hand washing. So if you've got gross contamination on your hands in the form of bodily fluids, you should really be looking at washing your hands rather than just by uh, applying an alcohol based solution. And then we're not really going to talk about this again anymore throughout these slides, but surgical scrub then is then the sort of top end of this tier of hand decontamination. So we're only really going to be using this before performing surgical procedures. We usually take a lot longer doing it. And what we're aiming to do with that is to remove as many microorganisms from the hands through the resident and uh, transient floras as possible. So performing um, effective hand hygiene is again really important. The actual technique and how we're washing our hands can be just as important as what we're washing our hands with. Um, most of us are probably familiar with these kind of infographics that are available. Um, it was originally adapted from the World Health Organization, that's who created um, this process basically and what it aims to do is really cover all areas of the hands um, some of them will include as well the forearms and um, the wrists and forearms which again if you've got gross contamination that has fallen onto your arms that's when you'd want to be including them in it um, and making sure as well the actual drying process is also quite important. So once you've washed your hands, you're not just walking away with wet hands, you're wanting to make sure you're using a disposable towel um, to actually dry off as well. So then you are fully ready and clean to go and carry on with any procedures that you plan to carry out. So looking at alcohol-based solutions. Um, so like I said, these can be a really nice um, alternative to actual physical hand washing using antiseptic soaps and waters. So they typically are a combination of alcohol and water, usually around about 60 to 95% ethanol or um, isopropanol. Um, these are better, they're not, sorry, the 100% is not as effective, so that's why they come in a 60 to 95%. The water addition is actually what helps to break down proteins. And most of them as well will have an addition of an antiseptic agent, most commonly it's chlorhexidine, and then an emollient which helps just to try and prevent drying out of the skin. Um, so these rapidly act to break down um, or this transient bacteria on the hands. Um, but the issue with it is once you've applied it and put it on, obviously anything that is on your hands is still there, even though it has been killed. So that's where 
hand washing can be a little bit superior to this because you are actually physically washing away anything that would be on your hands and potentially causing if you have missed any steps out you haven't quite applied the gel properly and you haven't quite killed all of that transient uh, flora on your hands you could then be looking that you may end up spreading something somewhere which you wouldn't get with the physical washing of hands using the correct techniques because you should be washing everything away and off of them um, these alcohol sanitizers can also be a really helpful thing with a lot of barriers that come with um, hand washing. So time is one of the biggest things that's highlighted in a lot of studies when they look at human medicine and veterinary medicine and they question people on what is one of the biggest barriers to them actually washing their hands for the correct amount of time. and before every time they perform like a procedure or handle a patient. And most of the time it always seems to be that time is one of those big factors here. So that's where these alcohol hand gels can be really handy. Just in between things, if you haven't got gross contamination on your hands, they can be a really quick and easy way just to make sure that you are appropriately getting rid of everything that you need to off of your hands there. But it is still important to take care of the skin on your hands. Um, obviously, these still have a drying effect. Some of them do contain, like I say, emollients that can help prevent that drying. But sometimes there is still a chance that you can cause some dehydration with your skin that leads to cracking, which then traps in bacteria which we don't want so still making sure that you're using a nice moisturizer along with these so just some considerations so like we were just discussing our um, skin barrier um, so this is important so this is your first defense that your body has pr to prevent pathogens from entering so it's really important that we make a bit of an effort to try and keep this as intact as possible which is obviously quite difficult with our job when you're getting scratched and and pulled around by patients you know and you're hand washing all day it's so easy for your hands to really dry out and start to crack and and have crevices that are going to really trap in bacteria so it's a really good idea um, to just try and remember to take care of them as well you know we use our hands for a lot of things so you do really want to take care of them um, consistency is also important um, you know it's a really good idea to make sure that you've got a solid protocol in place for this um, especially now with the times that we're going through this is going to become an even more paramount part of our our day than infection control and biosecurity already was important but it's going to become even more to the forefront now with everything going on so it's just something to assess do you have a protocol in place are staff effectively trained in hand hygiene do they understand everything that goes into it um, you know and it's something I'm quite like now and moving on to hopefully everybody else is going to start looking into more is auditing could you actually audit these and come up with a protocol that suits your practice and to improve hand hygiene techniques and make sure everybody is complying with it and washing their hands as and where they should be and also now um, being bare below the elbow. Um, I think sometimes this can be kind of forgotten about sometimes. Um, so it is important that we're not wearing jewelry, that includes watches, rings, uh, fitness trackers, all these kinds of things can act to actually protect pathogens. So when you're actually washing your hands, it can prevent and work as a barrier so that your antiseptic uh, solutions and your alcohol gel based solutions aren't going to get through and reach to them so it is really important um and i keeping the below the elbow is important because it just improves that hand hygiene technique and also just keeping fingernails short and clean and making sure you've got availability of all of these products so do you have enough hand washing stations for people do you have enough alcohol gels around the practice in high key areas where you want people to be washing their hands more again that's really important because that's going to be another barrier for people not doing this technique effectively so when do we want to look at washing our hands and when could we maybe look to using gels in place of hand washing so um, we're all probably aware of these sort of moments of hand hygiene and um, this has been adapted from human health care where there's usually a, a hospital bed and sort of what points of when you come into contact with that patient should you really be thinking about hand hygiene so for ourselves really it's all about trying to minimize um, fomite 
trans and sort of indirect transmission through fomite contact and that fomite contact we're looking at is potentially the animal so before you come into contact with that patient just making sure that you've alcohol gelled or washed your hands thoroughly and then if even if you're coming into contact with their environment so this could be their kennel it could be their food bowls their leads anything like this then we should be thinking about washing our hands or just putting on some alcohol gel before we do that so we're not then taking something from somewhere we've touched before it could be you've just come off of the phone you've put that phone down you realize that patient needs meds you go straight into that kennel you don't know what you've taken from that phone that you're then passing on to that patient's environment and that patient for then the next person that comes along and touches them you know they're then looking at picking that up and spreading it further around the practice so it's really important to make sure that we're remembering to do this before we touch them and obviously it comes to the same saying that after we've had contact with the patient and its environment that we should be again looking at either alcohol sanitizing or looking at actually washing our hands so the difference between whether should you alcohol sanitize or should you wash have you come into contact with any bodily fluids so this could be blood um vomit urine anything like this and really you should be actually physically washing your hands over just applying an alcohol gel and then obviously any aseptic procedures that we're looking at carrying out. So this is not an exhaustive list at all. Um, and obviously in between, if you're dealing and handling with a patient and it is something that we now have to kind of consider even more is again, coming back to this sort of the phones ringing, you're helping the vet with a, a procedure, you are there and you need to reach over and answer the phone you know and just thinking about actually should i really be picking that up without just sanitizing first and thinking about the next person and if you haven't got time to be doing it just making sure the areas you've touched have been cleaned afterwards so this is where then our ppe kind of comes into play as well so there's been a lot of um, discussion probably in the news um, and there's a lot of contention over the use of masks and gloves and I'm not saying I'm going to completely remove all of that for you um, but hopefully you'll come away after this sort of thinking when you should be using these um, different forms of PPE and when you shouldn't. Um, so with gloves you're looking at putting on a pair of gloves um, before handling patients um, and or assisting with patient exams um, so once you've obviously cleaned your hands first then applying a pair of gloves before you handle any bodily fluids um, or infectious material and during any cleaning or um, laundry especially if there's gross contamination present so gloves are not the be all and end all um, they're not a substitute for good hand hygiene techniques but they do provide um, a minimized um, help to minimize the risk of transmission by providing a physical barrier for our hands um, but they need to be changed really regularly so once you're done cleaning or handling or assisting with that patient before you do anything else just removing those gloves and being careful how you do remove those gloves because this is also important that we're taking off our PPE correctly um, just to minimize um, contamination of ourselves um, so you don't want to be getting the outside of those gloves onto your uniform if you can help it and onto other areas at the inside of your hands um, so when you're removing them making sure the outer surface does fold into itself and you're disposing of them immediately. Um, I'm aware with sort of shortages and things now that some people have been struggling um, to get hold of gloves. There are some good resources out there that do discuss the reusing of gloves um, and there is the potential to wash them between um, doing procedures and, and handling patients. Um, I would just say to be careful with it and make sure you're trying to adhere to the protocols as best as you can if you can obviously avoid reusing um, things like examination gloves and change them between what you're doing that is going to be optimal um, but as long as they are cleaned effectively and dried and there is no physical damage to them there is the potential that during times if you really are struggling to replace your PPE and you're wanting to really minimize the use of it you could potentially reuse them but I would just be really really careful with it 
So the next thing then is um, our gowns. So I wouldn't say these are really necessary for routine, um, day-to-day, all-day work. So if you're assisting the vet with a patient coming in, that you're not concerned that there's any um, infection risk in the household, um, then really just keeping good social distancing, good hand hygiene and gloves should be adequate um, adequate enough. Um, really, we want to be trying to save these forms of PPE for um, if we've got a risk of handling vulnerable patients or if um, there's a risk of contamination from maybe infectious material or gross bodily fluids. If you feel like it's going to be a procedure where there's going to be a lot of gross contamination around and your uniform is going to become contaminated, it would be worth wearing a gown for that. Um, ideally these should be um, disposable gowns um, and it's going to depend on what procedure you're doing as to whether you wear a permeable or impermeable gown so if you've got a lot of um, potential risk of fluid that um, you're looking at maybe could contaminate yourself then you'd be wanting to wear an impermeable gown to just prevent try and prevent that fluid from getting through to your uniform um, and again, ideally with these, we don't really want to be reusing these disposable gowns. Um, I would just say to them, really consider how effectively you can remove that gown without contaminating yourself or equipment or the environment. Um, it's more so getting the gown back on where you can't really always guarantee that you're going to be able to get that gown back on without causing some form of contamination. Um, another alternative would be fabric gowns. Um, these should be treated just the same as disposable gowns if you are using them and they are the only option you have. Um, they should be changed between patients and then immediately put for laundering after they've been used. Um, you could always potentially, if you wanted to, um, go a little bit further with them to sterilise them as well if that was what you were wanting to use them for kind of more high risk um, patients that are maybe a bit vulnerable but otherwise just generally having them laundered um, effectively in between you should be fine and obviously any torn or damaged gowns need to be replaced because you've basically lost that barrier of protection. So just some more considerations is just actually how to correctly remove a gown so I say you want to optimize um, how you're using these pieces of PPE to prevent you actually contaminating yourself and your uniform. Um, so there's no point in wearing a gown if then you kind of take it off and you cause a lot of contamination to yourself. Um, so when you're removing these um, disposable gowns, you need to unfasten it from the back or break the ties. If you're not planning to reuse it, it may just be easier actually just to break them. And then actually peel the gown down from the shoulders and the arms by pulling the gown at the front of the chest. So you're effectively pulling it away from yourself. You then want to roll the gown up trying to keep the contaminated side on the inside and then dispose of that gown um, using your uh, regulation so it would be either into clinical waste or infectious waste it's going to depend what you've been handling then you're removing your gloves and then washing your hands and if you do find that you've um, become contaminated underneath the gown ideally we should really be changing our uniform and potentially washing any skin that has come in contact with that contaminated clothing as well because we're putting ourselves at risk so masks I feel like this again has been another one of those things that's been you know very very much discussed and it does vary um the advice does vary quite significantly depending on country as well so um currently looking at what is being recommended in the uk and what is being recommended um to veterinary practices that we consider wearing a mask only if social distancing measures can really not be adhered to while we're dealing with members of the public or clients um, or with colleagues. Um, if we're dealing with an owner or an animal from a potentially infected household or a positive household, um, or if we're looking at if you're bathing a patient and you're going to be creating a lot of splash or aerosol risks, then a fluid resistant mask would be ideal for those situations just to prevent yourself from breathing in any aerosolized droplets. Um, or if you are in a really poorly ventilated, really close working environment as well. So there are some recommendations for when you can be wearing a mask um, and it's really weighing up 
your kind of your practice and and your risk um and really maybe looking at, at doing like a risk assessment you know how how at risk do you feel you are in practice and and weighing it up from there so some of the considerations with masks so we do have to look at the kind of evidence-based medicine that is out there. Um, there isn't a lot based around veterinary evidence-based um, medicine, but there is a fair amount into it with um, human um, evidence-based medicine. But there is limited and, and most often conflicting evidence and actual use of face masks or face coverings with general um, populations. So there isn't a lot of um, evidence to back up the use and how they how they actually affect everybody out in in the general public um, but there is potential that it does reduce uh, droplet transmission from asymptomatic people so again I think it just comes down to weighing up the risk of where you are and whether you feel like you would need a mask for that situation or not um, but one of the most important things um, with these face masks is that we're actually using them appropriately because if we're not using them appropriately then you might as probably not as well have put one on in the first place um, so the use of most masks that we have in practice are going to be disposable um, if you are looking at using cloth masks I would probably still use the same kind of procedure and look at them again as a little bit like um, our fabric gowns so if you're using them for a particular situation they should be removed afterwards and laundered and then used again rather than having it on your face all day taking it on and off I think it'd be difficult to wear a cloth mask all day without um, potentially causing some form of contamination so when we are applying these masks we want to be looking at actually handling them by the loops only um, you've washed your hands first before you actually go start putting it onto your face so you're holding it by the loops of ties with the stiff or metal edge up towards the top and the color part of the mask should always be facing outwards with the plain side usually it's a white they're typically white and blue so the white side facing inwards um, if you're not sure I would always just check the manufacturer's guidelines it should tell you which side is the outside side of the mask so when you've then hooked those loops over your ears you want to conform um, that little stiff edge over the bridge of your nose we're effectively trying to make as much of a seal as possible um, obviously without doing full seal tests you know you aren't going to get a perfect seal with most general face uh, face of surgical masks um, but you want to try and get the best that you can and you want to ensure that you're covering the full nose mouth and chin so you don't want to be missing anything out so it should be a fairly snug fit there shouldn't be gaps along the side or on where your cheeks are these should fit quite nice and snugly and once in place you really want to avoid touching it so you don't want to be taking it on and off to speak to people touching the center of it fiddling with it lots you know the more you kind of fiddle with it and the more you touch it the higher the risk you are of um, contaminating it and then potentially causing yourself some contamination as well um, so and obviously if it becomes damaged or grossly contaminated you are going to have to look at disposing it and replacing it um, and same so when you're finished with it just disposing of it into appropriate waste receptacles so our uniforms then so we all generally wear a uniform we do this to try and help form a bit of protection for ourselves and our patients um, I feel like there's a, a little bit of almost um, pride that comes along with wearing our uniforms outside of work and, and letting people know kind of what we do but I really think now we need to sort of change that kind of mentality and start thinking about the kind of wider general public and not be wearing our uniforms out and about um, I think it just it does set almost a bit of a, a bad example and it is hard to see when you do see nurses doing it and personally I have still seen it happen sometimes but definitely it's uh, it's not as common an occurrence as it used to be so I do think we need to kind of follow suit with that really um, so in an ideal situation you'd be changing your uniform before leaving the workplace and if there is the facilities for it to launder uniforms there um, if that's not possible then as soon as you're getting home you're not kind of making the trip to the shop on the way you need to be getting home changing out of your uniform 
laundering it as soon as you can um, and also it's recommended then to take a shower as well just so that you're making sure that you're washing off any potential contamination um, and obviously trying to avoid sort of a hugging pets and family members um, and just trying to really get in and get that uniform off so that again you're just minimizing the con um, contamination that you're taking home. Um, when it comes to laundering um, again it works in our favor that this is an envelope virus so it should be sustainable acceptable to the majority of um, laundry detergents um, and I would just recommend using the highest temperature possible that you can um, that won't damage the clothing. So actual nursing consideration for um, patients that we may have in from COVID-19 positive, COVID positive households. So there's been a lot of debate over whether we should be washing or wiping down of animals. We did briefly mentioned this in the last um, webinar, but it was quite brief, so I thought I'd just go over it again. Um, it's probably not really going to improve the fomite potential by wiping over these animals. So if you're just wiping over the top of the surface, um, you're probably not going to be getting everything off of them. So thinking about the time and the contact, increased contact you're going to have with that patient by either trying to fully wipe them down or by bathing them completely it's just not really realistic um, and you've also got the risk of if you decided to go for full bathing where you're showering these patients you risk in creating um, aerosolized particles that you could then potentially breathe in that you wouldn't have done beforehand um, so I think it'd be just a much better and an easier and simpler solution to just make sure you're following really good hand hygiene techniques. You're using gloves and gowns um, to handle these patients and if you feel like there is an aerosolized risk also wearing a mask while handling them as well. So whether we should be isolating um, completely or barrier nursing these patients. So there is a very minor difference between this. Um, so obviously when we isolate a patient with say a zoonotic disease that we're concerned about it spreading to other animals and uh, to employees or to clients, then we'd be putting these animals into complete isolation. Um, and I think it really kind of depends on your practice and your practice setup and the facilities that you have available as to whether you feel it would work better for yourself to place these animals into an isolation unit or whether you can effectively barrier nurse them still in the kennel ward or in the cattery. Um, so it's just about kind of really adhering to those good hand hygiene protocols. We're trying to minimize um, contact with the environment if possible. So having these patients having all their own equipment, so we're limiting the leads that we use with them. They have their own food bowls, nothing is shared. So again, it's just trying to minimize that transmission of pathogens really between those animals and ourselves and then us moving it onto the environment. Um, and also you get the preventing of issues if you are able to just bury a nurse in a normal ward over actually separating them and putting them into an isolation ward you are kind of minimizing that risk of them getting all of the associated risks um, associated um, risks that come along with that which is separation of anxiety they can get really stressed a lot of animals can get really depressed because they are generally left alone for quite long periods of time. You know, there are things we can do to try and try and help with that, but it isn't quite the same as having people kind of there and walking past. And also if you've got quite a high risk patient that you're concerned about, that you feel like you need to be watching and monitoring more closely, sometimes that isn't always ideal in an isolation unit because it is easy to get swept up with other tasks and other animals that you may just forget to go down and have a little check on them and also so then having somebody just a single person handling them as well. So walking these patients, um, again I think this is all going to come down to what your practice is like and what facilities you have. Um, so ideally you wouldn't be mixing these animals from a suspected or confirmed household with any other animals that are being hospitalized or being brought in. Um, into the practice of the clinic um, so 
again, that's going to come down to whether you need to isolate them or whether you can effectively barrier nurse them. Um, so when you're walking them outside, the aim is really to just reduce, again, this transmission risk. Um, so if you are walking them, do you have a segregated area that you can walk them in, that you're not going to be bumping into clients and their animals in the car park? They're not then going to be other animals kind of walking constantly in that area where there is a potential for indirect transmission. Um, and if you are walking them that they're walked last and after all other patients it might be an idea again depending on your facilities if it's an enclosed uh, walk area that can be washed down maybe just giving it a wash down after you've had that animal out there so that's pretty much everything I think I managed to stick to my time today um, so if there are any questions um, I'd be happy awesome. to answer now <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda. Another really great presentation. Thank you so much um, for giving your time um, to present to our members and, and the wider profession this evening. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody has any questions, we've had a couple of questions come in, but please do type into the chat box. Um, I'm just going to pop that out and make it bigger so that I can see everyone's questions rather than have it in a tiny little box whilst i'm doing that um the uh webinar next week um is from um so i'm just putting the questions up um is presented by katie ford and is uh, well-being and mental health normally the bvna webinars are a member only benefit but at the moment during covid we are opening these up for the wider profession so it is free to register i'll pop the link into the chat box um, towards the end once we've gone through all the questions um, okay so we've got a few questions um, come in so let's have a look um, so um question here there are several non-alcohol hand sanitizers which claim to be effective against coronavirus i have um, read limited research on these work on hard services do you know if these claims are viable and if there is research to support this Ooh, I'm not going to lie. I don't 100% know. Um, all of the research I did basically talks about alcohol based sanitizers. So I would maybe be skeptical. Um, you know, if you are purchasing these products from a particular company, just ask them. Um, ask the actual company is supplying it. Do they have any literature to go along with these products um, and then you can always assess for yourself then whether you actually feel like there is enough evidence backing them or not because yeah like I said there's no point using a product if it's going to be ineffective um, so yeah as much as technique is the kind of main driving point you still want to know that it's actually doing the job to to kill off these microbes um, so it might be worth looking into I assume some of them may contain antiseptics which is what actually would be working alongside to maybe kill the back, uh, bacteria or any pathogens that are on your hands um, but yeah I definitely say maybe contact if you're looking at buying them and ask them if they've got any literature to back it up I hope that answers that question <laughs> brilliant thank you Amanda sometimes you know it, it is looking if there's limited research out there um, then you know as I say the best thing that you've said is, is to contact the manufacturers and ask them directly yeah uh, another question here, um, going to early on in your presentation, you advise that nails should be short and clean. Uh, that nails. nurses are increasingly seen with acrylic or gel nails. Is this appropriate or do these increase the likelihood of contamination? So again, there's a lot of conflicting studies out there. The majority of evidence seems to point towards that having something on your nails is a potential to hold in bacteria so i would just be really careful with it again i think this is going to be based on a on a practice protocol and whether yeah. you decide um a by practice by practice basis whether you ban nail varnish completely um yeah i do think that the there is sort of evidence that points towards there being a risk of um, even these sort of gel nails that don't chip and things. There's still gaps and little things like I've personally had them myself. There are still gaps and bits that potentially you could be looking at getting 
sort of microorganisms hiding underneath there so yeah i would just be careful um and especially during these times it might just be worth to put a bit of a blanket ban on it same with being bare below the elbow brilliant thank you um another question here how likely are pets to be carriers of a virus um so it's not really known at the moment um so there are a few kind of sources coming out that are saying there is the potential for them to be fomites and obviously the i I believe there was a case in China of the dog carrying it and I think there's been a tiger and two cats am I right in thinking that um so don't don't exactly quote me on all of those um so there isn't a huge amount pointing towards them being a fomite risk but I think it is something we have to consider especially when animals are in the house and people are you know you naturally are hugging and kissing and touching your animal all day long and if you have got an asymptomatic household then there is the potential that they may be carrying some um, virus particles on them so it's just again using your good hand hygiene and social distancing and you shouldn't really have too much of an issue with it. Thank you. Um, another question here um, what temperature would you recommend washing bedding at, um, especially for those pets from a, a COVID-19 household? Um, most bedding, um, anything on a 60 degree wash and up. Um, and again, being an enveloped virus, it works massively in our favour. So it's going to pretty much kill anything on a, a sort of 60 degree and up. And again, like I said, with your clothing, it's kind of not wanting to fry any uniform. So washing on the kind of highest temperature that the manufacturer guidelines recommend. But um, yes, yeah, so a 60 degree and up for bedding should be adequate. Brilliant. Thank you. We've got a few questions on masks I'm just trying to group the, the masks to saying questions together so bear with me a second okay. um, so we've got here about masks um, should we, we be wearing face masks when dealing with the public and other members of staff um, and also on masks do masks become obsolete after being worn for a certain amount of time um, and the benefits of masks um, over face shields or are face shields um, preferred over masks for close working? Okay, so that, can I go back to what the first question was? Um, yep, so should, should we be wearing face masks when dealing with the public and that. other members of staff? I think it depends whether you can um, adhere to social distancing or not. So if you're going to be in, put into a situation where social distancing isn't possible, um, and obviously it is, it is difficult with the day-to-day -day of being around other members of the practice and again I think that's weighing up on what your practice is advising you to do if you feel that you're at risk from um, respiratory droplets between yourself and a colleague doing a really close um, procedure that you can't distance yourselves from then yes I probably would be wearing a mask and and yeah again with the with dealing with sort of clients and the general public again if you feel like you cannot keep two meters away from them then yeah i absolutely don't think there's anything wrong with wearing a mask for that um, uh, what about the length of time um, um i think it just depends what and why you're wearing it and how well you applied the mask have you if you've applied the mask appropriately you washed your hands beforehand you haven't caused any contamination you could probably wear it for as long as you need it i can't see why anybody would want to wear a mask for a full eight hour shift um and like i said i think you're going to find that you're going to struggle not to contaminate it in some form so really we only want to be wearing these masks for doing and carrying out these procedures where social distancing isn't possible so they shouldn't be on for particularly long long periods of time really no more than a couple of hours i i can't really see uh, and like i say if anything then you get any form of gross contamination on there you're going to want to be changing it thank you would you what's your thoughts on face shields instead of masks um actually yeah, i didn't think about putting face shields in there i think yeah absolutely if you've got the option of face shields um again it's another added um form of ppe on top of the mask as well so it is going to form another barrier of protection from um, actually the respiratory droplets themselves so if somebody coughs or sneezes within sort of a close proximity to yourself it is going to help but they tend to be more kind of used with 
human health care because obviously they're in people's faces they're doing mm -hmm. procedures that are creating a lot of aerosolized um, particles which isn't so much of an issue for ourselves so there's nothing wrong with using them and wearing them um, but whether they're really completely necessary I'm not 100% sure really brilliant thank you um, there's a question here um, that isn't um, I'm not sure is relevant for this presentation um, oh. but I'm just going to mention it and point the person in the right direction if that's okay Amanda yeah, that's um, we have um, someone asking um, that they're on furlough and due back to work in July but they'll be 26 weeks pregnant is it safe for me to go back we actually covered this in a previous webinar so you should be able to go back and see the recording um, which I think it was last Wednesday Wednesday, all the Wednesdays, I'm afraid, are merging into one for me with a webinar every Wednesday. I think, I think it was, it was Wednesday, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was particularly on maternity, furlough, uh, in the current situation. So that recording will be available. So uh, if you need details of how to find it, please just message us on the Facebook page or bvna at bvna.co.uk and we can send you the direct link for that. Um, Okay, I think um, that's most of the questions um, covered. Um, we've got a thank you, excellent presentation. Um, I think, Lou, um, are you there? Do we have any questions coming in on Facebook that I've missed? We just have one question. Um, just wanting um, sort of further clarification on um, about being bare below the elbows. Is yeah. that a blanket ban on being bare below the elbows? I I would say so. I don't think it's unfair. And with the summer coming in, we're not going to be needing to keep warm underneath. Um, and yeah, I really think it does. It does really just improve your hand hygiene technique. It's something less to worry about that you're not getting contaminated. You're not having to take sort of rings on and off. And if it's for just your shift and that's all we're recommending it for really is just for during your working shift is that you are just bare below the elbows if you can it would be so much more ideal from an infection control and biosecurity point of view lovely thank you that's it for for me on facebook everything's come through zoom really so yeah that's the only question on facebook awesome thank you very much for your help um this evening lou um, it's difficult to uh, um monitor every every uh, avenue in, uh, at the same time so thank you thank you very much um, if anybody has any more questions um, Lou is still on the Facebook um, and checking for me I'm still looking at the chat box we'll keep Amanda connected for another couple of minutes if, if there are any more questions please do type them in uh, as always when we uh, end the webinar there is a survey a, a link to the survey so please do fill that in and give us your feedback as i as i said previously our webinars are normally a member benefit but we are opening this up to the wider profession and the industry at the moment in this situation um, so um, do please fill in the survey and give us your feedback um, if you're not a veterinary nurse or a student uh, veterinary nurse we do offer associate membership um, so I know some attendees on these webinars have been um, outside of a veterinary nursing profession so do have a look we do offer um, associate membership to uh, the wider profession so do have a look at that um, let me go back to the chat chat box um, thank you very much brilliant talk thank you great webinar thank you thank you so much great talk um and um i think a question from one of the uh, um, a dog walker we've had dog walkers and groomers and doggy daycare people on here so it's really great to see everybody um together discussing these issues um and the question is dog walkers are being advised to wipe dogs down with a wet cloth using water only is this effective? Should other sprays be used? And she's named a product which I'm not familiar with, I'm sorry. Um, should other sprays be used such as Lucillin? I'm sorry if I'm not pronounced that wrong. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. 
Yeah, I have. I've, I've briefly heard of it and I've heard of it being mentioned. Again, I think it comes back to the same as like I've advised us having these patients coming into practice. I, if you're just wiping the, over the surface of the animal, you're not really getting deep down into the skin. So I can't see a lot of benefit there from doing that between every dog. I think you'd be much, much better just adhering to really good hand hygiene. Um, and also like after you've had a dog, say in the back of the car or you've walked them that you're cleaning any equipment you've used afterwards and you're properly cleaning down the area um and i did go over sort of disinfecting the last webinar so i'm going to plug that one <laughs> yeah. so there is the part one to this that does go over then sort of more disinfectant sort of techniques and how we should be looking at doing that as well so i think really there are better options than us just wiping over the top of a dog or or spraying on a product that's then just sitting in the coat really brilliant um, thank you very much Thank you very much for that, Amanda. I have popped the link to the next webinar uh, into the chat box if people want to register for that, um, which is the uh, wellbeing webinar. Um, I think we managed to stream to Facebook Live, so uh, that was great. I think that's all the questions we have. Um, I'd just like to say a big, huge thank you to Amanda, um, because I know um, you had to do a night shift last night. I did. So, uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody, for turning up, and I, I didn't yawn once, so. <laughs> no, you did very well. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you very much, Louise, for helping me this evening. I really appreciate that, um, and have a, um, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks. Bye for now, everyone.